Hey, thank you for joining us today. My name is Chad Clausen. I'm the associate pastor at our Church on the Move location in Glenpool, Oklahoma. So excited that you're with us here today. And so if you happen to be new, I would love to uh, just extend a, a $5 Starbucks card first off to you, but also, man, just let you know, we wanna get to know you. We wanna know what God's doing in your life and how we can connect and support you. Um, so to do that, simply text the word Glenpool to the number 23101 and then click the link that says new here and we'll be able to connect with you that way. Um, now let me set the stage for what you're getting ready to experience. Uh, you're gonna hear an encouraging message that as we live out our mission, which is to introduce people to the real Jesus, I believe you're gonna be able to listen to the message practically and simply apply it to your life and whatever that looks like for meeting the real Jesus, I believe that God's gonna meet you here today. So let's go ahead to this week's message. Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to be here. I feel kind of loose. Uh, I don't know if that's good. We'll find out. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be at Church on the Move Glimpole. I'm happy you're here. I'm happy you're watching online uh, at whatever point in your week you're watching. We're glad that you're a part of what is happening right now. I believe that God has something to say to you, wherever you're at, to people in this room, to those of you who are a part of our church family, you're watching online, uh, unable to be in the building for whatever reason, we love you, we miss you. However, you are just as much a part of what we're doing here as if you were in the building. Amen. We are excited about what God is doing in this space, outside of this space, at Church on the Move at large. If you haven't met me, my name is Gabriel. After the service, uh, I'll be back here and I would love to meet you. If you have complaints, um, send those to Church on the Move, Broken Arrow. They <laughs> field those. And uh, I will be uh, available for all good comments after the message. And uh, I'm excited to be here. I've been, I've been thinking about this this week, this message, as you would hope. And um, it's sort of a one-off weekend. It's not a part of a series. And, 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 and sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's a little bit tricky. Uh, just trying to figure out, all right, what is one thing? What's one thing, all right? One thing that we need to talk about. Where are we kind of at as a church, and what's one thing? We've been talking about the church. We, we just finished up a series of teachings called Why Church, where we asked the question, why do we do this? Why are we engaged in a church community? And it's good, right? The corporate church is moving together. It was for us as a body. It was for us as individuals. Uh, excellent series, uh, excellent teachings on why the church. Uh, but today, what I want to talk about, it's associated with that because I don't believe that we can move forward as a church without this. Today, I want to talk about hope. I want to get our hope up. Today, the theme is just up. It's all good because God is really, really good. He's better than we think he is. I think if we I don't think, I know, because there have been moments, moments in my life. It doesn't happen every day. I wish it did. But there have been moments in my life where I have felt awakened to the goodness of God. And in those moments, I find myself overwhelmed. Overwhelmed by how good God is. And I believe that he's just giving me a tiny thimble full of, of, of a dose of his reality. And in that, I feel overcome by his love, by his peace, by his goodness. We need this. We need to know that God loves us. We need to know that God is for us. If we're going to move forward as a church community, if we are going to be the light to the world that we are called to be, if we're going to take whatever we hear teaching-wise and move it forward, we have to know first that God's word is true to us. The mission of God will never go forward through us until it gets to us. So today I want to talk a little bit about hope. We all have been given spiritual gifts, every single one of us. You feel them. You sense them. I remember being a teenager, and a teenager, early 20s, every once in a while, people would come up to me. And, and it didn't happen all the time, but, but sporadically, people would come up to me wherever I was at, at the church, and uh, they would just say, hey, I just want to let you know something. I can, I can see and feel the anointing of God on you. And they would, they would say a lot of things. And whenever I was a teenager, I was like, you couldn't be more wrong. You know, like... 
you have no idea. Whatever you're sensing in me, you, you, I think there was a guy standing behind me, and uh, you meant to talk to him, but, but people would tell me these things. But as I got a little bit older, I sort of sensed its truth. I will say I sensed its truth even whenever I was a young man. I felt it in my bones. It was just something real. It didn't, it didn't feel completely real to me because there were a lot of things that felt like that were in the way. Some of it youth, some of it experience, but people would tell me things like, look, one day you're just going to take off and you're like, a, you're like a helicopter. And one guy said one time, and I'm like, okay, I, I don't really, you know, okay, I'm a rise, but you're just, you're just not quite ready to fly yet, but you will. People would say things to me and I would just, I would just sort of listen, um, didn't know exactly what to do with it, but there was a part of me that it just sort of resonated with. Let me just say this to you. You would say, well, yeah, you're a pastor. I go, that's true for everybody. Every single one of you, no matter your age, you have been given an irrevocable gift from God. There is something in you that you may not always be able to pinpoint, but it's there. I believe that we can sense it at times. There have been a lot of occasions where I've had conversations with people who uh, maybe aren't quite living for God. I had a lot of these conversations with people in California, and what was really cool about it is, is um, you could see the light turn on in people's eyes. They hadn't really been exposed to the things of God all that often. And, and, and sometimes people would get around it. And, and, and what I would do, I got, I got to a point there where I would prophesy over people. And when I say prophesy, I don't mean um, like close my eyes, out-of-body experience, the Holy Spirit grabs my tongue, I start saying things I don't really know what they mean. Prophecy is speak life to dead things. I want to read you this really quickly. It's in the book of Ezekiel 37. This is a prophecy from Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. That's prophecy. It's a specific prophecy about a specific thing, but this is our creator. This is our God. This is what he does. He speaks life to dead things. Whenever I would have these conversations with people, what you could see happening as you begin to speak life over them. And it was a little bit scary at first. And by speaking life over them, what I mean is just going, hey, God has something for you. God's not mad at you. God has a plan for you. At first, when I, when I first got out there, I was a little hesitant because I, I, I kind of felt what I'm sure some of you feel. You sometimes feel God has something to say. I feel like maybe I should say this, but I don't want to overstep my bounds. And I certainly don't want to encourage someone to continue in their sin if I tell them, hey, God's got a plan for you. You're moving in the right direction. Whatever it is you sense, it's usually fairly general. We resist at times because we're afraid, like, what if they're doing something horrible? And I'm like, keep going, you know, in the horrible direction that you're on. God's not mad at you. He wants you to keep doing drugs. You know, that's what it feels like we're saying at times. I got over that real quick because I realized that the breath of God through my breath, um, moves people, stirs people. And as you do this, you can see the light kind of come on in people's eyes. And you could see in them a connection to who they really are in Christ. You could see a connection to who God made them to be. You could see this heart resonance. And in that heart resonance, a, 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 a reality of, I have certain things in me, gifts, God-given gifts, and I sense them. And people would begin to move towards them. But more often than not, what would happen is people would lose steam, like air being let out of a balloon. They would move towards God momentarily. 
I think this happens a lot, not just with the people far from God, but people close to God. I think that Jesus, I don't think, I know, he's always calling. Jesus is always calling us. And in moments, we feel this heart connection. We begin to move towards him and we sense it. You may walk out of here today and have a moment like that where Jesus is calling you and you feel it in your heart and you're overjoyed and you're stirred. Something is happening in your spirit. But then what happens is life begins to deflate the balloon and the air gets let out and we find ourselves back where we were. And it's usually the discrepancy between what we feel stirring in us and our reality. It could be our circumstances. It could be just the way we see ourselves or like I felt as a teenage man where I'm like, you know what? That's great. I can sense that you're telling the truth. Like if I had to bet that moment, the farm, I would say, you're probably right. However, I'm not there. I'm not there. I have a hard time buying into that and believing it. And if we as a church, a family, are to reveal Christ to the community around us, to do all the things that you hear taught here, if we're going to do that, we have to accept God to ourselves first. As individuals, God has something to say to you today. Not just in general, today specifically to you. So I'm going to preach But the Holy Spirit is going to do a better job, and He's going to get your attention in a particular way. I have no idea what that is. But it's going to happen today. That's exciting. That's a really exciting prospect because the Holy Spirit breathes life and not just life revelation that will change your reality. Today's a good day. God is good today. Our hope is going to be lifted. Look, life hurts. Life isn't easy. Life is frustrating. Life can anger us. I could talk on and on about why that's never been more true than today. Blah, 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 blah. Life hurts. Hope lifts. Hope lifts. We need to walk out of here lifted, not dejected, not discouraged, not angry at the people who are not doing it right, but uplifted by the hope of God because it's hope in God that lasts, that brings us through whatever season this is. We move through. So we're going to talk a little bit about hope. I'm going to read out of, a, out of a particular story in the book of Luke about a man named Zacchaeus. I'm sure most of you have heard this story before, at least I'm sure a lot of you have. It's in Luke 19. So if you have a Bible, Luke 19, if you don't have a Bible, pretend to have a Bible. You know, just, just flip through invisible pages while you're going, you know, sounds good for the cameras. Luke 19, we're going to put it up here on the screen so you can read it. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. He was wealthy. He wanted to see Jesus, but he was short. Couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down and at once welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to, the guest of, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him today, salvation has come to this house Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. We need hope in our lives. How do we get hope? How do we get hope? There are three things found in this story that I want to relay to you. Three things. The first thing, if we are to stir our hope. Before I get to that, I have a question for you. Where is your hope? I think it's important that we stop and pause. Introspection is a massive part of allowing this, the Word of God, to get through. 
You've got to find a place in your heart where you do more than just sort of let your mind go with the message. You have to let it sink in. And I find that it's helpful whenever I pause long enough to give you that space. So my question for you is this, where is your hope? I designed this little part of the slide to go up here one through five so you can identify it. Where's your hope? Are you to one? Where's your general sense of hope for the future? Where is your hope? Answer that question to yourself, honestly, the best you can. Now, how are we going to lift hope? Three things. The first thing is we have to find a new perspective. We have to find a new perspective. We have to look at things in a different way, through different eyes, which is why I always preach and pray, Lord, open our eyes, because we can be looking at one thing the whole time, and then with proper perspective, we can see Jesus. This is true in Scripture. It's true in the Gospel. It's true when Jesus was resurrected. People came up to him and thought he was the gardener. But then he opened their eyes and they could see him for who he really was. That's what we have to have. We have to have a new perspective. Zacchaeus was not a tall guy. He was a tax collector. He stole from the people as most tax collectors did. He hears of Jesus, Jesus' reputation. I can't even imagine what it was like. What would it have been like in this little community to hear of a man who was healing the sick and the word would travel and every time he would come into a town, people would flock and throng. They would bring anyone who wasn't well to him and try to get close to him. I can't even imagine. Here comes Jesus through Jericho. Zacchaeus desperately wants to see him, but he is vertically challenged. And so he's like, what do I do? I climb a tree. I climb a tree because I got to see past the crowd. Zacchaeus knew that if he was going to lock eyes with Jesus, if he was going to see the man that he had heard about, he had to get above the crowd. So the first part of a new perspective is quite simple. Who's your crowd? Who is your crowd? What is the thing keeping you from seeing Jesus? Not just on a Sunday, but in your finances. What is the thing keeping you from seeing Jesus as Jesus pertains to being the Lord over your dollar? What is keeping you from seeing Jesus in your marriage? And don't point to your spouse now. In counseling, you can. What is keeping you from seeing Jesus in your family? What is keeping the reality of the Son of God and the work of that he brings, the the new life he brings. What is it keeping you? You you, you have to rise above it. But we don't rise above it through through sort of self-belief. Self-belief is a massive part of a cultural narrative right now. Jesus said this, in the last days men would be lovers of themselves. Look, I don't know exactly what time we're in. I never thought we would live to see 2020 based on the things that I heard growing up. And it wasn't particular dates. I just thought, look, as long as I can get married and, 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 and enjoy the, you know, what happens with that, then, then he can come. But I doubt we'll make it to 2020. I mean, I never thought 2020, but yet here we are. And maybe you'd go, we didn't make it to 2020. Look around. You know, I don't know. But here we are in a space where we've got to see Jesus in a new way. We have to let the power of Jesus come into our life. He's got to be able to affect us. For some of you, you live with regret. Maybe it's familial regret. Maybe you have, uh, as a parent, maybe you got to a place, maybe your kids are out of the house. And they're not where you thought they would be. Maybe they're not where you thought they should be based on the job you did. In some ways you feel like, did I not teach them properly? In some ways you go, I know I didn't. And, and, and now they're outside of my influence and it is a constant burden for me. New life. Jesus wants to breathe new life into your situation. Jesus wants to resurrect what's been broken and lost. But in order to do that, we have to have a new perspective. And in order to do that, we have to rise above the crowd. We have to get past the things that are blocking us. 
we have to see Jesus in a, in a new way. Zacchaeus was willing to do something very undignified, which was climb a tree. A man in his position would not climb a tree, but he did it because he was desperate to see Jesus in a new way. And my question for you is this, and it always comes back to this. Jesus is here. Jesus is willing. Jesus is ready. Jesus is at the door. He knocks. What are we willing to do to get the door open? What are you willing to do to gain a new perspective? What is it that the Holy Spirit would say to you in this moment? Maybe it is a thing that you have heard a zillion times, and it's so simple. Just do this, just do this, just do this, but you resist it. I find that it usually is very simple. And here's what I know about God. God doesn't like to move on. He whispers the one thing, and then he stays there until we do it. And we're looking for new things and we're looking for new ways and we want new revelation and we want God to do a new thing because we don't want to do the old thing that he told us to do, if we're being honest. And so God is still whispering the same thing. What is the same thing that requires a new perspective? You've got to rise above the crowd. You know what I love about this story? I love that Jesus says to Zacchaeus, I must come to your house. Before Zacchaeus really ever did anything, Jesus sees him. He sees you where you're at right now. He sees you. You may feel stuck in the crowd, the crowd of your mind, the crowd of your situation, the crowd of your financial situation, the crowd of your familial situation, the crowd that is a lack of purpose, whatever it is. Wherever you find yourself, or maybe you're just in a place where you're like, hey, things aren't that bad, but yet internally, spiritually, you feel a bit numb. Jesus sees you and says, I must come to your house. Jesus is coming to your house today. A new perspective we must have. The second thing that we have to have is a new response. We have to have a new response. We're never going to get anywhere if we keep doing the same thing, hoping that everything just sort of changes without anything actually changing on our end of things. A new response. Jesus comes to Zacchaeus' house, and Zacchaeus stands up and proclaims, I'm going to give back everything I stole. N not only am I going to give it back, but I'm going to give back four times what I stole. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go above and beyond. And, and he seems to do this with great joy. I think so many of us are afraid to follow God, really follow God, because we're terrified of what it is he's going to ask us to lay down. Look, I'm with you. There are some times where it's like, I'm just not in a place where I feel I can sacrifice right now. I don't want to sacrifice. I really want to be filled up. I don't really want to have, I don't want to give anything. I want to get something. And it feels often that God's, you know, sort of default language is, what are you going to give up? What are you going to give up? What are you going to give up? But here's what's interesting. Zacchaeus does something quite painful. I don't know how wealthy he was. I don't know how many people he stole from. But he says, I'm going to give back. And he says, I'm going to give back four times what I stole. That's parting with a lot of money. But he seems to do it with great joy. Why? Because he has a new perspective. A new perspective leads to a new response. The thing that we're afraid of, I would say this, if we're afraid to obey God and we just keep feeling like it's going to be a loss, it's because we haven't gained a new perspective. We aren't really seeing Jesus. We're just simply seeing the sacrifice. And when we're just looking at the sacrifice, the sacrifice is difficult, but when we see Jesus, it makes the sacrifice easy to manage. Zacchaeus stands up and proclaims, exclamation points all over the sentences. He's excited to part with his money. Why? Because Jesus is in his face, in his presence, has honored him with his company, and it moves his heart and soul to the point where he's willing to do anything. In 2006, we were moving to uh, Dallas to help start a church. And I think I might have told this story once before, but it bears repeating. We were moving to Dallas, and we were selling our house, and we, were, we had actually sold our house, and we were not far off from moving. And um, I was doing my taxes, and I, I, I found that I had a, a refund of $3,000 
coming back, which, which, you know, was a big deal to us at that point because we were venturing into a new place, a new land. Things were more expensive there than they were here, and we weren't sure what we were going to need, and we didn't have much to begin with, and we're heading down there, and I think, man, thank God, praise God, $3,000. I've got $3,000. But whenever I saw that number, for whatever reason, this was the time that the Lord chose to bring back to my remembrance all the times that as a youth I had slipped money out of my dad's wallet, my mom's wallet. This was back in the days when parents carried cash. Kids, it was great. Cash was everywhere. Always cash. Now, there's just, you know, there's, there's too much accountability. What are you going to do? Take a debit card? It's right there. They can see where it was spent. But cash leaves no trail. And so I had cash, and I would just periodically slip money out of my dad's wallet, out of my mom's wallet. At the time, I, 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 I guess I felt sort of bad, but I needed money <laughs> or wanted it. And so I would just sort of take money here and there. Here I am, 28 years old, something like that, and I've got this refund, and in that moment I feel the Holy Spirit say to my heart, you need to pay your parents back. I thought, I don't want to do that. (laughs) On one hand, I thought, shoot, but on the other hand, I thought, you know what? We're about to go into this, this, this adventure. It was really our first experience in ministry was not in Tulsa, it was in Dallas. In Tulsa, I was a graphic designer for the church, but ministry started for us in Texas. And I knew that God was doing something. I was excited about what he was doing. And with joy, I called my mother and revealed to her, my mom, I called my mom, also very important. (laughs) Hey, tell dad. Uh, uh, it's funny, I still do that periodically anyway. Um, I called my mom and I told her, hey, you don't know this, but this is what I used to do. <laughs> Surprise! Uh, and I said, but, I, but, but you know, <laughs> don't jump in. Let me just tell you where this is going. I told her what I felt like I was supposed to do. And I said, I feel like I'm supposed to give you $1,000. I don't know what I took. A thousand's a lot of trips to the wallet, so I just felt like that's, that was a big number for me, and so I said, I'm going to give you a check. My mom reluctantly accepted it because she knew I needed it, but she also knew I had to obey God, and so she encouraged me to do that. With joy, I wrote my mother a check to give back what I had taken because I had a different perspective. It wasn't one of fear or loss or potential loss. We're not going to have enough. I just thought, God, I'm so grateful in this moment that you, you see me here. And can I just tell you, in those days, I felt a lot like Zacchaeus. I thought, I, I want to see Jesus, but I, I got a lot of crowd between me and him. And I felt like him calling us to do something more than what we were doing to be a part of his work was such an honor that I gladly stood up with exclamation point and said, here's $1,000. A new perspective leads to a new response. But I will reiterate, Jesus accepts Zacchaeus' company before he ever responds with obedience. Jesus says, I must go to your house, Zacchaeus. I must come to your house. Before Zacchaeus ever says, I'm going to pay back. Why? Because that's your God. He loves you. He loves you. He finds you. People sit in this room and feel distant from God. You feel like you have good reason to feel distant from God. Jesus is not distant from you. It's just who he is. He's good. The last thing is this. I'll call up the keys. If we're going to build our hope today, to move forward to the future that God has for us, we must accept a new identity, a new identity. The end of Luke 19, the story I read, Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. 
Jesus calls Zacchaeus a son of Abraham. He identifies with him. So many of us have a view of ourselves that is not what Jesus sees. We think we have to work hard all the time because if we don't, then we're going to fall short. It speaks to who we are. We can't stop. We burn the candle at every end possible because if we stop, if we slow down, it speaks to our worth and our value. Some of us never get up off the couch because we're afraid that when we do, we will be found deficient. We will give it our effort. We will give it what we've got. We will speak out of boldness, but quickly be put back in that place that we've lived in, which is just sit there and be quiet because you don't really know what you're talking about. This doesn't have to do with your age. This is just a human condition. It is the way of this world to break down humanity. But the way of Jesus is to lift humanity up, to elevate humanity out of a place of mud and dirt and grime and pick you up and breathe life into dry bones. The spiritual gifts that are in you, as I said earlier, are irrevocable. But for some of us, they have laid dormant. They are dry bones, but today the breath of God comes into our situation, but it starts with you as a person. As an individual, seen by your creator, you are nothing more than a creature. I find that to be comforting. It's not something that I see as a negative. I think, man, I'm just a a creature created by a being. I am not responsible for everything. I don't have to figure it all out. I am not capable of being what the creator wants me to be apart from the creator. So if I find myself in a place where I'm struggling and failing, doing it on my own strength, I shouldn't be discouraged. It should just confirm to me that I was made by someone better than me. And he loves me. And he wants to pick us up today to build hope in us because we will get nowhere without hope. Hope breeds faith. Faith breeds action. We will become who we're called to become, but we can't do it without hope. I'm passionate about this. I am passionate about purpose. But not just my purpose. I am passionate about you connecting with your purpose. Years ago, not you, well, a couple years ago, my wife and I went to Colorado and we did this thing called a life plan. I'm not going to get into all that it is, but it was incredible. It was emotionally grueling. You essentially go back through your story. It's a, it's a, it's a Christ-centered thing, and you are sort of, it shows you your strength, helps you define, or, you know, yeah, you define your spiritual gifts. In it, you have like a life purpose statement that you sort of create for who you are. It just basically, it helps you put anchors in the road where you sort of know who you are. It doesn't line everything out. There's no tarot card reading, but you know enough to move forward. And you're like, yes, it resonates with your soul. And it's a beautiful experience. In it, one of the questions that the lady asked us was, you have an opus gloria. Basically, what do you want people to say about you at your funeral? Kind of dark on one hand, but on the other hand, it's like, okay, what do I want people to say? I've lived my life. I've done everything that I've done. Now I'm in a place where I'm no longer here. What would I want people to say about me? Not an easy thing to nail down. I sat there for a while and thought about it. And I eventually came up with four words. Gabe fought for me. 
my spiritual gift is to fight for God's children. And so one of the things that stirs my soul, it moves me to move you. I don't get up here and think, man, did I do a great job? Do people love the way I preach? Maybe that's in there somewhere. <laughs> I care deeply about you connecting with your purpose. And see, I can say that without bragging because it does not come from me, it comes from your Creator. Your Creator gives gifts to men to move His family forward. God put me in your life today, whether you're in here, whether you're watching online, God put me here to tell you that He has a purpose for you. And it must be fought for. I'm fighting for you, but you have to fight for it yourself. It requires a new perspective, a new response based on a new identity. You are who He says you are. Do you know that? Do you remind yourself of that? Are you aware of what God says about you? Not just generally, but do you speak it over yourself? Do you keep these anchor points in front of you? It's what's required to buy into a real reality, His reality. It will build your hope. The world won't shake you. The world won't move you. You will be anchored in deep concrete. It's who He is. And because it's who He is, it's who you are. Let your hope rise because your Creator sees you today. Not just in general. He sees right where you sit. He loves you. His heart is so moved at each of you. So let's step towards him. Would you bow your heads, please? You're in the room. And you say, man, my relationship with Jesus is not where it needs to be. I'm excited to do this moment right now. I'm excited to do it because it's not a down moment. It's an up moment. It is a time for us to say, you know what? I'm so thankful that Jesus keeps chasing me down, that he keeps saying, I must come to your house. And it doesn't mean to respond to this moment that you find yourself in deep iniquity, that you're stuck in a terrible way. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. It doesn't matter. You're numb to Christ. You're just not where you want to be and you know it. Today is a day to climb down out of the tree. Jesus is coming to your house. If you're in the room and you say, that's me. I don't care how long you've been coming here. I don't care if you're new. I don't care if you've been here for a long time. I don't care if you're in the room, if you're watching online. If you say, today's my day on the count of three, wherever you're at in this space, watching through a camera, I want you to lift your hand and lift it tall. After you lift it tall, you can put it back down. It's important that you do something physical. Remember a new response, a new response. Not the same one we always do where we go, yeah, that's good. I should probably lift my hand, but I'm not going to because what difference is it gonna make? I already know what to do. I'll just do it on my own, but nothing's changing. A new response. So on the count of three, if that's you, lift your hand. One, two, three, any hands, any hands all over the room. Thank you. You can put them back down. It's not important that I see your hand. It's important that God sees your hand. It's important that you show your creator, hey, I'm here. I'm here. I need help. Of course you need help. We all need help. We're just creatures who he loves, who he's calling. I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer. All of us, repeat this prayer after me. Say this, dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for seeing me, for loving me, for pulling me out of the dirt today. I accept your sacrifice. Lord Jesus, you died for me on a cross. You were resurrected to bring me to life. Thank you for giving me new life. I stand on who you say I am. Not because I feel it, but because you say it's true. I accept your reality over mine. 
and move towards it with a full heart. Thank you for seeing me, for saving me, for forgiving me, for making me clean, making me whole. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Thank you for everything that you're doing in the life of this church and the life of these people. Thank you for speaking to our hearts, for helping us see. Thank you for being here with us. Holy Spirit, weld the truth to our heart. Make it a part of our DNA. Remind us new perspective, new response, new identity, new perspective, new response, new identity. Help us latch on to truth because the truth sets us free. Lord, you're good and it's out of a full heart of goodness that we walk out of here today knowing you're our God, that you love us, that you wash us clean, that you have a plan for us, that you have a purpose for us, a future for us. And then you write our name in a book and we live with you in eternity forever in perfect peace. We can't even fathom what that day is going to be like, but yet we are excited about this day because you put us here for such a time as this. You knew we'd be here in 2020. You knew it would be the worst year ever. <laughs> but you put us here anyway because you're for us and you're with us and you've got a plan for us to thrive, not just survive. Your children don't survive, we thrive. We are excited about this day. We are excited about this week. We are excited about what you're doing. And we, with open ears and open eyes, will move towards it. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. It is in that name we believe. It is in faith that we stand. I thank you so much. Amen. All right, if you just made that decision during that prayer, you said, yes, I want a relationship with Jesus. First off, I wanna say congratulations and we celebrate the new life that you have. Second off, I wanna say we don't want you to do this alone. We wanna be there for you as a church. We wanna answer questions you might have and help you figure out what is the next step that you need to take. To do that, simply text the word Glenpool to the number 23101 so that we can connect with you and help you figure out what does that next step look like and hear about what God is doing in your life right now. Now, if you have kids, what I want you to do at the end of this video is to click the link for the KOTM YouTube channel and go over there and watch what's happening in our Kids on the Move page. Man, it is incredible to see what God is doing, not just here in our local area, but literally around the world. We've had over 30,000 people who have subscribed to our Kids on the Move channel. And not only that, but of those 30,000, over 50% of them are coming from outside of the United States. So God is reaching kids all around the world. And what I want you to hear in that is, that is all possible because as a church, you are a generous church. We are a generous church. And that's what we wanna be about so that we can reach more kids through that. And so if you are here today and you're ready to say, hey, you know what? I wanna take that step to give. I wanna to contribute to what God is doing in the lives of kids and adults all around the world. You can simply text the word GIVE to 23101 and then follow the prompts and it will help you to contribute towards what God is doing all around the world today. So now as we get ready to roll into the next week, man, I wanna say thank you for joining us today. If there is anything that you need in this life, if there is anything that you are struggling with or you just have questions about, we wanna be there to connect with you. The simplest way to do that is to text the word Glenpool to 23101, look for the most appropriate prompt, and then let us know about what God is doing there, what you have questions about, and we will connect with you as soon as we can. I hope you have a great week. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you soon.